Good afternoon. The 19th Dr. Lourdes Manahan Lectures in Rheumatology is now streaming live from the University of the Philippines, Manila. I am Dr. Esther Pensurga, the Division of Rheumatology, University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. I am your moderator for this afternoon. I would like to thank our sponsor, sponsors, Novartis, Zuilig, Farm, Zuilig Pharma and Siltrion Healthcare, and all our participants for joining us today. Please post your questions at the Q&A box and uh, we, will, we shall address them during the open forum. You will also receive your certificate of attendance a week after you submit your evaluation form and the post test. The link will be posted later. Okay. So this is the last of our eight part LMLR series for this year. The LMLR series aims to teach the basics and update health and well-being and SDG4 quality education of the World Health Organization. The Division of Rheumatology is happy to announce its publication of two books, The Atlas of Rheumatic Diseases in the Philippines and The Physician's Guide for to Tele-Rheumatology. Both books can help the non-rheumatologist in the proper approach to the initial diagnosis and management of various rheumatic diseases. Those who wish to avail of the books may contact us. We have special discount rates this Christmas season. Okay. Our lecture today will focus on the management of foot pain in patients with arthritis. We are deeply honored to have two distinguished and young speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Angeline Therese Santiago. Dr. Santiago completed her Rheumatology Philippines at the, uh, Fellowship at the Philippine General Hospital. She is a clinical associate professor and the coordinator for fellowship training of the Division of Rheumatology in the UP PGH. Dr. Santiago is also an active internal medicine and rheumatology consultant at the San Juan de Dios Educational Foundation in Medical Center Manila and in Hospital ng Manila Medical Center. Our second esteemed speaker is Dr. Bernardito Alpuerto II. He is an orthopedic surgeon whose training started at the Philippine General Hospital and continued in St. Vincent's Private Hospital and North Shore Private Hospital in Sydney, Australia on foot and ankle surgery in Brisbane Private Hospital in Brisbane, Australia on hip and knee arthroplasty and in, in Selspital, Bern. University Hospital in Switzerland on foot and ankle orthopedics. Dr. Alpuerto is also a clinical associate professor and heads the foot and ankle adult and trauma service of the Department of Orthopedics in the Philippine General Hospital. He is the education committee lead of the Fragility Fracture Network of the Philippines. He also serves as the head of the Department of Surgery at Los Banos Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now welcome Dr. Santiago and Dr. Alpuerto as they share their expertise in today's topics. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. 
Thank you to our division for this opportunity to lecture and therefore learn and relearn. And thank you, Dr. Penserga, for the kind introduction. The main objective for this lecture is to discuss the approach to treatment planning in a patient with arthritis and foot pain. So to do this, I have broken down this lecture into three parts. I will first give a brief overview, and this will serve as our um, foundation for the topic. Then we will discuss the burden of disease. And finally, um, we will try to learn to how to approach the treatment of our arthritis patients with foot pain by discussing three cases. Okay, let's go to the overview. Our feet perform important functions, especially in locomotion. They give us stability when standing and they are responsible for our mobility. Most physicians, myself included, find dealing with foot pain difficult, probably because of the complexity of the foot anatomy. But one way of simplifying how we remember our foot anatomy and evaluating the foot is by loose, loosely dividing it into three anatomic regions, the forefoot, the midfoot, and the hind foot. So the hind foot, this one is below the ankle and consists of the talus and calcaneus, while the joints of the hind foot include the talocalcaneal, talonavicular, and calcaneocuboid articulations. The midfoot is comprised of the three cuneiform bones, the navicular and the cuboid, with the tarsometatarsal joints connecting the forefoot to the midfoot. The forefoot consists of the toes and metatarsal bones, along with the metatarsal, metatarsophalangeal joints and interphalangeal joints. Later, you will see how important knowing these regions are in determining the cause of foot pain. Okay. So in getting a foot pain clinical history, we need to first characterize the pain well, elicit the precipitating event, the event can be from an antecedent trauma, from a change in activity, and even a change in footwear can trigger pain in the feet. And most importantly, you need to assess for the presence of red flags, which include nighttime pain, fever, and systemic symptoms, which may indicate um, etiologies that are more serious in nature, such as infection, bone tumors, neuropathy. Okay, so these are important key points not to be missed in your general medical history. So you have your age, occupation, activities such as participation in sports, involvement of other joints, and even involvement of your spine as well as comorbid conditions such as diabetes, um, peripheral neuropathy, presence of systemic inflammatory arthritis, and vascular disease or vasculitis. So once the patient comes into your clinic, the physical examination begins. You can begin by examining the gait. We know that the gait has two phases, the stance phase, which accounts for 60% of your weight-bearing phase, as well as the swing phase. Inspection should be done on weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing. You check for inflammation, deformities, skin problems. You also infect, inspect the patient's footwear or the shoes because the wear patterns on your patient's shoes can give you an important clue on um, the feet pathology. You check for the normal range of motion and if deviations from these norms are elicited, this should be noted as part of your standard PE. And finally, you can palpate the feet by anatomic region. Okay, let me go back. Depending on the location of the pain, it is possible to determine the possible etiologies. For example, osteoarthritis and most of the inflammatory diseases are known to affect the forefoot. Likewise, hindfoot pain 
immediately reminds us of the possibility of plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis. And thesopathy can also be a cause of hind foot pain, especially in patients with spondyloarthropathy or uh, rheumatoid arthritis. The midfoot is less commonly affected in inflammatory arthritis. Pain from the midfoot is more commonly mechanical in cause. If the pain is poorly localized, we, consider, we can consider causes such as vascular injury, neuropathy, or pain arising from central nervous system sensitization or your nociplastic type of pain. Okay. Let me now go to the burden of illness. Both arthritis and foot pain are major public health problems with an increasing burden given our aging population. Foot pain is present in almost a third of the older population and is more common in women, with a prevalence of pain at specific foot locations ranging from 7 to 13%. Recent data show that the prevalence of symptomatic radiographic foot osteoarthritis was almost the same as that of knee osteoarthritis at 16.7%. And it most commonly affects your metatarsophalangeal joint, particularly your first MTP joint. Among patients with inflammatory arthritis, it is even more common. In this Singaporean study of 101 patients with inflammatory arthritis, so the population included patients with RA, gout, spondyloarthropathy, psoriatic arthritis, and undifferentiated arthritis. Majority had foot pain over the course of disease, with almost half experiencing ongoing foot pain. So most epidemiologic data on foot pain and inflammatory arthritis is on patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that majority or almost all patients with RA will have foot pain in the 10 years after diagnosis with more than half of foot pain occurring during the first year of diagnosis. So having discussed that Foot pain is very common in patients with arthritis. It is therefore important that we know the appropriate way to diagnose and manage this condition. I will now discuss in the next slides three cases which can give us an idea on how to approach foot pain in some of our more commonly encountered arthritis. So let's go to the first case. She's a 68-year-old female presenting with pain on the feet. So this patient is a known case of knee osteoarthritis. As you can see in this image, she has genovarus deformity with bony swelling of her knees. She's being managed with topical anti-inflammatory agents, as needed oral NSAIDs, and uses a walking cane to help her ambulate. However, in the past months, she noted pain on the feet, especially when standing and walking. And this pain is prominent on both of her first MPP joints and on the midfoot. She also reported short-lived stiffness, which improves with exercise or activity. On examination, you noted that she walked with an antalgic gait. This is an unaltered pattern of walking secondary to pain wherein the stance phase is shortened as the patient attempts to reduce the time of weight bearing on the affected foot. You can see on physical examination um, some deformity on both her first metatarsophalangeal joints. You have here your hallux valgus, meaning that the great toe is deviated towards the lesser toes. However, there was no overt inflammation detected. So based on her presentation, this is likely a case of foot osteoarthritis, specifically your first MTP joint osteoarthritis. 
there are currently very few agreed guidelines for the clinical diagnosis of foot or ankle osteoarthritis, but a diagnostic rule developed for first MPP joint osteoarthritis suggests five clinical observations that can accurately identify radiographic first MPP joint OA. These include prolonged pain duration of more than 25 months, dorsal exostosis, hard end feel, crepitus, and limited dorsiflexion of your first metatarsophalangeal joint. MTP OA or first MTP joint OA can be diagnosed if three criteria are fulfilled. And this diagnostic criteria has a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 71%. Diagnosing midfoot OA is harder and more complicated because there is no formal diagnostic criteria. You can diagnose it by taking into consideration the demographics such as age, gender, body mass index, and the arch index, which is a measure of static foot posture derived from a carbon paper foot imprint. Diagnosing midfoot osteoarthritis usually requires imaging. So speaking of Im imaging, x-ray still remains the imaging of choice to check for foot osteoarthritis. And you need to obtain a weight-bearing, those dorsoplantar and lateral views. A major recent advance is this foot-specific radiographic atlas for, gra for grading as a grading system to score osteophytes and joint space narrowing from zero meaning absent, to three, meaning it is severe. So the first metatarsophalangeal joint, the first and second cuneo-metatarsal joints, the navicular first cuneiform and talonavicular joints are graded as they are easily vis visualized in your do dorsoplantar and lateral views. And if you have a score of two or greater for either osteophytes or joint space narrowing on either, either of the views, then you, might, you may be diagnosed as having radiographic foot osteoarthritis. Here are examples of radiographic osteoarthritis of the feet. You can see here joint space narrowing and osteophytes in your first MPP joint. You have joint space narrowing in your first and second cuneometatarsal joints. For pharmacologic management, data from randomized controlled trials on foot osteoarthritis are sorely lacking. And we use medications that are recommended and with evidence for knee osteoarthritis. These include paracetamol, topical NSAIDs. Um, so your topical NSAIDs are frequently used in foot osteoarthritis, but surprisingly, um, there are no clinical trials of this medication on foot OA. We have one randomized controlled trial showing benefit of peroxicam and naproxen. This is just a small randomized controlled trial. There are case series illustrating benefit of intraarticular steroids and viscosupplementation in short-term pain relief of foot pain in patients with foot OA. Another important aspect of foot osteoarthritis management is footwear modification. So your first MPP joint osteoarthritis pain usually occurs during the propulsive phase of gait when the proximal phalanx is compressed against the first metatarsal head. So this can be addressed using a footwear modification known as a rocker sole, in which the sole of the shoe is curved, and this allows the body center of mass to roll over the base of, base of support, reducing the need for your first metatarsophalangeal joint dorsiflexion, thereby reducing the pressure under the first MPP joint by 12%. Foot orthosis is another modality that can help manage the pain of foot 
arthritis, these are inserts placed inside the shoe to alter the magnitude and location of forces acting on the plantar surface of the foot. So these are the two main types. The shoe stiffening orthosis um, is a thin insert, semi-rigid insert, that extends the full length of the shoe, and it aims to reduce the dorsiflexion and compression at the first metatarsophalangeal joint during the propulsive phase of gait. The contoured orthosis is usually to give support for the medial longitudinal arch, and this can be very useful for patients with a flattened medial longitudinal arch. So those patients with flat feet or pes planus. Physical therapy modalities are also important in affording additional pain relief and strengthening exercises as well as gait training. So the management of foot osteoarthritis should be multimodal in approach. Let's go to our second case. Our second case is a 48-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis. She has been diagnosed with RA for the past three years, managed with methotrexate, prednisone, and occasional NSAIDs. On follow-up, by remission, uh, by DAS28, she is on remission. So DAS28, this is a tool to measure RA activity by take, take, taking into account the patient's and physician's overall assessment of disease activity, the number of swollen and painful joints in 28 joints, which include the shoulders, elbows, wrists, MCPs, PIPs, and knees, and acute phase reactants, usually the ESR. So the DAS28 measures disease activity of rheumatoid arthritis, but it does not include the feet in its activity measurement. So on examination of the feet of your patient, you noted this appearance with swelling of your first MPPs and the second IP of the left foot. You also noted deformities such as your hallux valgus deformity, you have your crossover deformity of the lesser toes. So this case illustrates that despite the seemingly quiet rheumatoid arthritis based on conventional disease activity scoring measure, the problem in the feet can be missed. They are often overlooked in your usual um, examination. So... In this 2011 guidelines for the management of foot health problems associated with RA, this is from the Northwest Clinical Effectiveness Group in the United Kingdom, a foot screening pathway was proposed to enable identification of those patients who are at risk of deformity and other problems of the feet like ulceration so that Appropriate and timely interventions can be initiated, and it also serves as a guide for referral to other members of the rheumatology multidisciplinary team. So the foot screening should be done at initial diagnosis and annually, and it's quite comprehensive. You can see that the foot health assessment requires evaluation of symptoms associated with RA. So that means you need to check for joint swelling and tenderness. You also need to evaluate the skin, the nails, the vasculature. You check for presence of neuropathy. You check for foot structure to check for alignment, mal malalignment, to check the foot function and gait, activities of daily living, as well as lifestyle factors. So all RA patients should be evaluated regularly by a rheumatologist or other trained healthcare professionals in the area. Aside from your history and physical exam, the footwear of the patient should also be assessed. Ideally, the patient should be wearing shoes with sufficient room in the toe box and with a stiff sole. These are other ideal shoe features. So they need to be lightweight, they need to be spacious and adjustable with an easy to close instep. They should have a strong raised and padded heel with inflection point at the MTP joints. They should be of adequate length and width, which is measured in standing position. 
There should be no seams on the inside to prevent ulcerations, and the insoles should be removable to allow for adjustments. For diagnostic imaging, if you want to check for joint damage, then you can request for a non-weight-bearing non foot x-ray in the AP view to check for deformities and mild alignment. You can order for a weight-bearing foot x-ray in the AP and lateral views, and you may use ultrasound, MRI, or CT scan if you want to check for evidence of inflammation that are not really palpable by physical examination. So the management of foot pain on, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis depends on the cause. So if the foot pain is secondary to rheumatoid arthritis disease activity, then you need to manage that uh, according to how um, rheumatoid arthritis is managed based on treatment guidelines. So this is through adjustment of your conventional synthetic TMARDs or your biologic TMARDs. You can also give corticosteroid injections for localized um, inflammation. An early consultation with an orthopedic surgeon may be beneficial as these patients are prone to um, damage and deformities. So aside from um, proper footwear advice and prescription, other conservative measures include your foot or throat foot orthosis, um, which can be used, the type of which depends on the type of deformity, and exercises to strengthen the surrounding muscles, to improve mobility, and to stretch the plantar fascia and the Achilles, Achilles tendon. So these are sample ex exercises for the feet. So here you have um, the piano key exercise, wherein you try to raise the lesser toes while keeping the big toe planted firmly on the ground and then you alternate. So this is an example of strengthening exercises for your intrinsic muscles of the feet. This is an example of your plantar fascia stretch. Okay. So there will be cases wherein your patient might need surgical intervention and these are the indications. So if you have a patient with persistent pain, stiffness, chronic inflammation, tenosynovitis or tendon ruptures, malalignment which is leading to mobility lim limitations and difficulty in finding proper shoes, um, skin problems and infections such as your septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. So surgical intervention will be discussed later. Okay, let's go to our third case. Our third case is a 40-year-old female with, a, um, with psoriasis. She was diagnosed at 17 years old and has been using topical steroids and light, light therapy with good response. But 23 years after the onset of psoriasis, she started to develop foot pain, and this has become a chronic problem. So on history taking, you noted that she also has ankle pain, heel pain on weight bearing after a long rest, and swelling of some toes. So on physical exam, you noted here swelling of the entire fourth digit. There is also dactylitis in the third digit of the right foot. You also have a swollen and ten tender first interphalangeal joint of the left foot. On further examination, you noted heel tenderness, but there was no erythema swelling or warmth. There was also tenderness on the posterior ankle. So these physical examination findings can point to an additional problem called enthesopathy or enthesitis. So our patient here presents with arthritis, dactylitis, and enthesitis. Okay. So... Our patient is now likely to be developing psoriatic arthritis. Among patients with psoriatic arthritis, arthritis of the feet and soft tissue involvement can manifest at onset and it affects 
more than 90% of patients with established disease. However, despite being a common problem in psoriatic arthritis, a survey done in New Zealand among healthcare practitioners, rheumatologists, physical therapists, and podiatrists revealed a perception among the group that people with psoriatic arthritis-related foot problems experience suboptimal management from symptom onset to diagnosis and treatment. So it's still an under-recognized problem. Okay, let's go to the problems that we saw in our patients. So first, we have dactylitis. This is an acutely painful and uniformly swollen digit or what you call your sausage digit. It is considered a hallmark of psoriatic arthritis and commonly occurs in the foot. It is a marker of poor prognosis. So if you um, visualize the affected digit by MRI, you can see that there is synovitis, stenosynovitis, enthesitis, capsulitis, soft tissue thickening, bone edema, and nail abnormalities. Basically, it's inflammation of the entire toe from the skin and nails down to your bones. So another problem that we detected in our patient is enthesitis. Enthesitis is inflammation at the insertion site of tendons, ligaments, fascia, and joint capsules to bone. And it affects 28 to 35% of patients with psoriatic arthritis. So the most common sites are as follows. So it's very commonly found in your Achilles tendon as well as in the insertion of the plantar fascia at the calcaneus. And like dactylitis, it is a marker of poor prognosis. So other involvements of the feet in psoriatic arthritis is arthritis or synovitis, particularly found in your IP joints and your MTP joints, tenosynovitis, primarily your flexor tendons, as well as the rare onychopachydermoperiostitis. So there are numerous validated disease activity measures for the skin and joint involvement in psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis, as well as for your enthesis, like the Leeds Enthesitis Index and also for dactylitis. However, we do not have any formal algorithm focused on foot health assessment. In the absence of formal guidelines and algorithm, I think we can also apply this framework intended for rheumatoid arthritis in evaluating our psoriatic arthritis, as this foot health is quite comprehensive. So imaging tests in psoriatic arthritis, so your x-ray will be able to detect um, damage. You can see erosions, joint space narrowing, and it, it is also useful to assess the subchondral bone. Your MRI and ultrasound are sensitive tests to check for synovitis, um, edema, enthesitis, dactylitis, as well as bone changes. Treatment of psoriatic arthritis depends on domain involvement. This is the most recent guidelines for the management of psoriatic arthritis, and this is from GRAPA. We can see that the first-line medication recommended for patients with enthesitis and dactylitis are your oral NSAIDs. You can also opt to give your biologics and even your conventional synthetic DMARDS methotrexate as initial treatment depending on the severity of disease. Um, for patients with peripheral arthritis, first line would be your conventional synthetic DMARDS. You can also give biologics at the onset depending on uh, the clinical features of your patient. So let's just discuss some of the extra-articular problems that we detected in our patient. So your, our patient has plantar fasciitis. This is the most common cause of plantar heel pain, and it is usually associated with uh, deformity such as pes planus, and it is also associated with a tight Achilles tendon. It is diagnosed clinically. The pain is usually on the heel, on weight-bearing, after rest, and improves with activity. Your radiographs are of little value as 
um, sometimes, even if you detect heel spurs, they correlate poorly with symptoms. So conservative treatment includes weight management, the use of heel pad or cushions, night splints and taping for short-term pain relief, stretching protocols can also be instituted, and um, other physical therapy modalities can also be given to reduce the pain and to help stretch the plantar fascia, the inflamed fascia, your ultrasound therapy, your extracorporeal shockwave therapy. Some patients might necessitate local corticosteroid infect injections. Usually, these are patients that do not respond to more conservative treatment. Okay, these are examples of your heel inserts that you can use in your patients with plantar fasciitis. Another problem that we detected in our patient is Achilles tendinitis. This is um, the Achilles tendon, no? the largest and strongest tendon in the body. And inflammation of the paratenon can lead to pain over the tendon, which is worse when initiating activity and improves with activity. It is usually aggravated by stair, stair climbing and shoes with a stiff heel counter. Again, the diagnosis is clinical. Um, on imaging, you might see a thickened Achilles tendon shadow. Or sometimes on lateral x-ray, you can see a haglund deformity. This is a posterior prom prominence on the distal calcaneus, which can predispose to Achilles tendinitis. So unlike plantar fasciitis, steroid injections are not recommended due to the higher risk of tendon rupture. Other conservative measures include your topical NSAIDs, activity modification, heel lifts, and physical therapy. There is only anecdotal evidence on extracorporeal shockwave therapy and platelet-rich plasma. So very little evidence for these treatment modalities. Yeah. So based on the three cases I discussed with you, I think it's clear that the management of foot pain should have a multidisciplinary and multimodal approach. Aside from local and systemic medications, we need to give Proper advice on foot orthosis, footwear, physical therapy, skin and nail care, etc. So in some countries, like in this example, in New Zealand, rheumatology podiatry clinics are established for comprehensive foot assessment and management of rheumatology patients with foot problems. And this can be very helpful to our Ruma patients. Unfortunately, this kind of clinic is very hard to find in our country. In PGH, we don't have a dedicated foot and ankle clinic. And even other major tertiary private hospitals in our country don't have this. So it's very hard to render comprehensive foot care. So this is one of the gaps in our management. So in summary, I have discussed with you that foot pain in patients with arthritis is a common problem and it needs to be given more attention during the rheumatology consult. Foot assessment should be performed regularly, regularly. Aside from medical management, there may be a significant role for conservative treatment, which includes footwear modification, the use of foot orthosis and physical therapy and exercises. We need clinical trials and prospective studies on treatment modalities for foot pain as they are sorely lacking and needed. We need a multidisciplinary approach and maybe establishing a specialized podi podiatry clinic will be of great benefit to our patients. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone. Thank you for that kind introduction. Again, I am Dr. Alpuerto from the Foot and Ankle Service of PGH Orthopedics. My talk today is about managing, well, mainly the surgical management of foot and ankle pains among patients with arthritis. This will be my disclosure. Aside from being a consultant in PGH, I'm also a medical safety consultant for the Puy Sintes under the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. This will be the outline of my talk. I will go through the common arthritis in the foot and ankle, highlighting their characteristics, and in the end, I will show some cases in which we've done a successful surgical management. Before we start, I just want to put this question up for everyone. 
if you lived up to eight years old, approximately how many miles have you walked? Of course, because of the figures in your right, it would mean that you walk for a very long distance, but you will still be surprised of the actual value, which is almost 110,000 miles or 177,000 kilometers. Okay, so to put it in perspective, the, the circumference of the Earth is around 25,000 miles, meaning you've walked around the Earth at the level of the equators for equator for almost five times for your uh, if you live up to eight years old so so your feet is they're very durable and i hope after my talk you'll have a greater appreciation and love for your feet your feet is an evolutionary marvel that really allowed us to roam every corner of the earth but of course through the years of walking running jumping and playing sports you ex expect no wear and tear and to set this will settle in eventually and this will lead to degenerative uh, changes in your foot and ankle and these degenerative changes of your foot and ankle joints uh, this is what we call arthritis or simply put the destruction of the articular cartilage of a joint it has many causes of course the classic age-related degenerative osteoarthritis very common post-traumatic arthritis in the younger age group inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis and crystal induced arthritis like gout seronegative arthritis and of course septic arthritis In terms of incidence, almost a quarter of the population will develop foot pain in their lifetime, and a significant percentage of this pain is due to arthritis. The most common cause is still osteoarthritis, and at the age of 65 years old, at least 80% of our joints are already affected. Foot and ankle joints are special because they are normally resistant to age-related osteoarthritis, but very prone to post-traumatic or secondary arthritis. Of course, if you have documented arthritis, its progression is affected mainly by the combination of your activities and genetic predisposition. The most common complaint if you have arthritis is pain. It could be occasional, could be intermittent during activities, or persistent if there is progression of severity. Arthritis could also lead to deformities and vice versa. For example, in severe hallux valgus bunion deformity like what you see in this picture if it will remain uncorrected it would eventually lead to arthritis if there is arthritis you expect swelling slight erythema unless this is of course a, a septic joint no or the swelling is and and the erythema is really uh is going to be huge no crepitations and of course decreased range of motion like this ankle over here Let's look at specific joints with arthritis. The ankle is quite special because primary osteoarthritis is rare if you compare it to the hips and knees. It has a different cartilage characteristic. However, because of its location and anatomy, it is very prone to post-traumatic secondary arthritis, like this severely fractured angle. Even if you fix this anatomically, no, like this way, no, it is still expected to, I mean, arthritis is still expected to happen, even if you successfully fix it like this, because the cartilage was already injured during the injury itself. Let's look at the subtalar joint. This is that encircled area over here. It is responsible in the inversion and aversion of the hind foot. Like the ankle, post-traumatic arthritis is usually the cause of subtalar arthritis. It could be from a tailor neck or body fracture or from a calcaneal fracture. Another possible cause, which is not traumatic, is talocalcaneal coalitions. This is usually congenital, and as the name implies, there is fusion of a part of the talus and calcaneus, leading to decreased or abnormal range of motion, leading to pain and arthritis. If you have subtalar arthritis, you will have pain on walking on uneven grounds, like on the beach. The pain is usually in the sinus tarsi area, 
or that soft spot just distal and anterior to the lateral malleolar tip. So the midfoot is this area over here. It is also called the tarsometatarsal joint complex or least frank joints. A significant portion of arthritis in this area is still caused by trauma. But the traumatic causes are also quite common and occurs from ages 50 years old and above. Causes could be from osteoarthritis, metatarsal length differences, especially when the second toe is the longest toe. If you keep wearing high-heeled shoes and charco arthropathy in diabetics. Arthritis in the midfoot often leads to bony prominences in the dorsum of the foot and cause pain when wearing tight shoes. If there is severe midfoot arthritis, especially in charcoal foot, you can have collapse of the arc of the foot, like this radiograph over here on the lower right. These are the common joints in forefoot arthritis. You are already familiar with hallux valgus or bunion deformities. Bunions are very common in middle-aged ladies with strong genetic predisposition and correlated with fashionable footwear. On the other hand, hallux rigidus is primary osteoarthritis of the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the big toe, but with no significant deformities. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of the main culprits in the development of severe forefoot arthritis and deformities with lateral and dorsal deviations of the foot, uh, of the toes. No? Bad footwear choices has been correlated with development of lesser toe deformities such as hammer and mallet toes. If you wear shorter shoes, the toes will curl dorsally creating a hammer toe deformity and often leads to plantar plate injury and callosities in the plantar aspect of the metatarsal heads. Like this radiograph on your right, Wearing shoes with tight and pointed toe boxes lead to constriction of the forefoot and cause deformities in the joints. Even before we consider surgical management, we should always try conservative management first for patients with painful or treated conditions of the foot. We can always give pain medications like NSAIDs, steroids, or opioids. Just remember to give them sparingly to avoid side effects and explain to the patient that they are not curative medications, only for symptomatic relief, depending on the severity of the arthritis. Steroid injections are staple in managing arthritis of the foot and ankle. Again, these injections are temporary and should be well-timed, depending on the needs of the patient at the moment in terms of mobility. So let's say the patient is going on a vacation in, for two weeks. So the week before, this patient could get like a steroid shot in his or her ankle or in the midfoot to allow him to enjoy his vacation if he's going to do a lot of walking during that vacation. So hyaluronic acid, no, this is the, uh, uh, the syringe you see, the special syringe you see on the upper right of the screen. So this could be used especially in, ankle, in the ankle joint, but studies are not robust. They are quite, and they are also quite expensive, no? And some, some studies have, uh, this is mainly used in the knees, by the way, no? Because you have a bigger joint in the knee, in the ankle, it's quite small. So you cannot really inject 4 ml of the hyaluronic acid. And there are some rumors that you get more uh, side effects or reactions with the hyaluronic acid in the ankle joint. No? So since the since arthritic pain is activity related, patients should be advised on how to properly unload the joint with the use of a cane or a walker. Another way to also do this and limit range of motion of the joint is by using an ankle foot orthosis, the one you see in the in the middle. No? Uh, and to also decrease range of motion of the ankle, you can also use uh, a special shoe or the rocker bottom type of shoe. No, as you can see, uh, it's like a boat, a boat shaped uh, shoes that will just transmit the force from your heel going to your forefoot and basically uh, not putting a lot of force going through your ankle joint or in the midfoot area. And of course, very famous, the different types of insoles you can use. 
Uh, try to use the ones that are custom made or bespoke to your feet and they should be accommodative and quite soft and quite cushioned, especially if you have deformities in your hind foot and mid foot. Okay, let's go to the surgical management of specific arthritic conditions. So let's start with the ankle first. So this is what we call the ankle arthroplasty, okay? So you're going to actually remove the, the damaged cartilage or the degener degenerative cartilage, and you're going to replace this with this uh, device over here. So the point being, if you remove the arthritic part of the joint, and you create like you're creating a new joint you will be able to still preserve the range of motion and reduce the pain of the patient now the indication of this uh, procedure is very strict no and not all patients with ankle arthritis are good candidates another problem is that this technology is still not available in the country here in the philippines but most asian countries have it already and another problem with this uh, device is that the recur uh, not recurrence or revision rates are quite high around 20 percent after five years so the technology is there but uh, we are still trying to master this uh, this device in terms of its effectivity when it comes to our patients so what most surgeons do here in the philippines for severe foot and ankle arthritis is fusion or arthrodesis of the joint meaning you are going to fuse that joint already and prevent it from moving thus eliminating pain so let's look at this case over here she is a young elderly 64 years old and very active lady who had a previous trimalleolar fracture who was fixed inadequately as you can see uh, by this red line over here that she has a severe virus uh, deformity of the ankle and because of this, she has she 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 had very significant pain and difficulty in ambulating for almost two years. So what we did was to remove the distal fibula, remove the cartilage, and correct the deformity, and fused it with two big screws. So this is how it her ankle looked like. Preoperatively, you can see the virus deformity of the ankle, and this was her post-op. And as you can see, she's walking really well at six months post-operatively. Okay, she's quite happy and satisfied. Okay, let's look at subtalar arthritis. So this is a 51-year-old male. Look, the cause of the arthritis is a chronic, untreated calcaneus fracture. This is really comminuted. As you can see from the other eggshell cuts, no? so because of this injury, uh, she, he's going to have pain in the subtalar joint, especially when walking on uneven ground. So the surgical management for this case, the surgeon did the subtalar fusion using this approach, and he applied a cortico cancellus graft in between. He placed this in between the talus and the calcaneus to facilitate better fusion and correction of the tailored dorsiflexion and restore the mechanics of the foot. As you can see here, it was secured by two screws. This is pre-operatively. You will see that the space in front of the ankle joint is small and post-operatively because of the correction of the angulation, it became uh, wider. So uh, that's really a great improvement in the biomechanics of your foot and ankle. So let's look at this young elderly nun who is very active. She has bilateral severe hallux deformity and hammer toe on, your, in, on her second toe. So as you can see here, there's a hammer toe on her second toe. And she, has already in, she was already in constant pain and had tried many footwear modifications through the years before she consulted me. So these were her radiographs. Look at the severe hallux valgus deformity with arthritis of the first metatarsophalangeal joint. And look at the sublock second metatarsophalangeal joint because of the hammer toe deformity. So we did fusion of the first MTP joint using a headless screw. 
and a small 2.7 millimeter plate. We also did lengthening of the extensor tendons in the second and third toe to improve the, the hammer toe deformity. And we reduced the second metatarsophalangeal joint and we secured it with one transarticular K wire. We also fused the, the second toe PIP joint no? at the same time so we can correct the hammer toe deformity. This is the PIP joint and we also fused that. So as you can see we, in this post-operative radiograph, the great improvement in the angulation of the first out of the big toe and also uh, making the forefoot a little less wide. So this was her six weeks after the surgery. You can clearly see the huge correction we were able to achieve. The patient was quite happy and we plan to do her left foot at around three to four months later. If you have severe deformities like in rheumatoid arthritis, it is quite difficult to reduce and fix all the toes. So we prioritize the big toe and fuse that. And for the lesser toes, we do resection arthroplasty, meaning we remove the metatarsal heads, metatarsal heads of the lesser toes to facilitate the reduction and correction of the, for the deformity. And we fix them with temporary K wires. And the K wires are removed after six to eight weeks. So for hallux rigidus, primary osteoarthritis of the big toe, first MTP joint, there is now a new technology that could replace the damaged cartilage in the joint no? to preserve its motion. So instead of using the joint, you can use the synthetic cartilage implant called Cartiva. So you call it Cartiva. It is made out of polyvinyl alcohol that mimics the properties of the cartilage. I think you can get this here in the Philippines as per order basis. I think the distributor, uh, we have a local distributor of uh, the company that uh, that's the company that's the main distributor of this uh, product worldwide. So it, this is a really easy surgery to do, and you can do it as an outpatient basis. So you basically open the joint, you drill a big hole in the metatarsal head, and then you place uh, the appropriately sized uh, cartiva, and then you reduce the joint again. You suture the capsule and that's it. No, very easy. So this will be my last slide. And as a summary, my, these are my take home points. I hope after this talk, you will have more appreciation of your feet and ankles. Their anatomy is quite complex and they are very, very durable. Please take good care of your ankles and feet because a significant portion of our treaty conditions are due to traumatic causes like fractures and sprains. Arthritis, once it sets in, is quite progressive and it can cause severe pain and disability down the road. There are many conservative treatments available, such as modified footwear and injections, but if they fail to provide relief, as a foot, we have, no? We have foot and ankle surgeons. You can readily call or consult to help with your uh, arthritis. And we are capable of doing established surgical procedures. And we also have access to newer technologies in managing arthritis in your foot and ankle joints. So again, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk and thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Santiago and Dr. Alpuerto, for those very interesting lectures. And for, as we focus on the foot, possibly the uh, most, um, most uh, misunderstood part of the body, we find that uh, our two speakers talked of uh, almost the same diseases that cause foot pain. And um, we have also questions from the audience that have been answered, but uh, there are some remaining questions here, which can, we can answer as we encourage everyone to put in your questions as our specialists are still here. 
So uh, for this first question, it's the uh, never ending question on the Munggo. Uh, okay. Ang laging reklamo, pag kumain ng Munggo, ang patient, ay sumasakit ang siko at ang sakong. No? So thank you for this question. Uh, would you like to answer this, uh, Dr. Santiago? Hi, thank you, Ma'am Pen, and um, thank you for the question because this is one of the more commonly uh, raised points during a RUMA consult, diba? They always um, attribute their musculoskeletal pain, their joint pain to dietary intake. So not just mongo, sometimes sitaw, beans, gano'n, ano. We have a... Uh, yan, ako. May anong pinapakita si Ma'am Pen? Bawal ba? Bawal ba ang monggo sa Rayuma? Meron kaming booklet. Our division produced this booklet a few years ago. And here in this booklet, we discussed the different types of arthritis as well as um, the common treatment and mga iba pang advice for patients with arthritis. This is for um, lay people. No? So the simple answer to that question is hindi dapat kasi ma-blame ang monggo. Kasi numerous studies show na hindi siya associated with arthritis. There are some um, types of arthritis na may kinalaman sa diet and ang pinaka-common na nga is yung gout na tinatawag. No? This type of arthritis that is associated with high uric acid level and formation of uric acid crystals. Pero marami kasing factor yon hindi lang siya diet. Kasama dyan ang genetics, pwedeng ibang medical comorbid conditions, um, pwede rin ang intake of medications. So, um, hindi lang siya isang factor. And in terms of diet, ang mas nakikita nila na nakakatrigger ng flare are those from animal sources and those um, as, like yung mga ano natin, alcoholic beverages like beer and even sugary drinks. So, actually yung mga gulay, hindi talaga yan siya known or proven um, dietary trigger for an arthritis flare. So, siguro ang suggestion ko dun sa patient na naka-experience niyan would be to have a more formal and more thorough evaluation by your healthcare provider to really identify the cause of your arthritis flares. Okay, thank you, Ange. So again, we... We have uh, a booklet that you can get uh, from your favorite uh, rheumatologist. You can go to the clinics and hopefully your rheumatologist still have a copy of these booklets. Bawal ba ang munggo sa rayuma? Ang sagot po namin dyan ay hindi po. There's another question here that again bears a very, be, uh, a, a very important question which is on prevention. Now, halux valgus, how do we prevent this? I think this question is uh, from the point of view of no arthritis yet and how we, how we uh, avoid developing halux valgus. Anyone can answer, Dr. Asiberni, Dr. Alberto, or Dr. Uh, Santiago? Uh, is it okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Is it okay, Dr. if I answer this? Yeah, sure, okay. sure. Okay, uh, first off, thank you, Dr. Penserga. Also, thank you to the Department of Rheumatology uh, for inviting me, no? Uh, great pleasure to be in this, uh, in this talk, no? In this session. And Dr. Santiago, thank you, no? Very comprehensive lecture. I, I, I learned a lot, no? Especially in the algorithms. Thank and you I have a, Yep, and I also have a patient with dactylitis and psoriatic arthritis did not come into my mind, no? So I probably have a question for you. <laughs> There's a question for you after this, you know, this talk, no? So regarding halux valgus, no, mainly this is a genetic so, uh, and commonly occurs in females. So if you look at the, the feet of your parents, no, specifically your mom, so grandmother, probably baka ma-inherit niyo yung feet nila no, for females. And this is also associated with footwear. No, uh, those people who wear fashionable pump up plump shoes, no, yung mga high heels na tight yung toe boxes, the pointed toe boxes, uh, they are more prone to develop uh, halux valgus down the line, no. 
in terms of prevention, no, uh, yun nga, uh, proper footwear, no, and also you can use some, no, but there are no strong evidence, no, uh, for the modifications you can use to prevent progression uh, because of that genetic predisposition. Nga. So you can use uh, toe spacers, no, there are no, uh, pag nag-type ka sa Lazada, or shopping ng mga braces for bunions, marami kayong makikita, no, from toe spacers for uh, bra uh, halux valgus brace or bunion brace, marami po makikita. It all boils down to what you can actually wear, no, or which which product is comfortable for you to wear. Kasi nga, uh, they are very cumbersome to, to put, no, especially the, the braces. They're difficult to, to use, no? especially when you're using closed shoes. No? The, the good thing about halux valgus, that's why this surgery is not that common. No? Before arthritis sets in, kasi minsan, the, the patients I operate on basically are the, the chronic patients na may arthritis na talaga. So usually we end up uh, fusing the first uh, MTP joint. No? But for those patients na early on, uh, usually, hindi nila pinapa opera Now, we have procedures na talagang correction, no? but this will involve also bone cuts and moving of the, correcting the angulation of the bone to, to correct the bonion deformity. But they usually don't do this surgery. They don't agree in uh, to have these procedures done. Kasi nga, uh, we, ano, mainit eh. we are in a tropical country. Most patients will not wear closed shoes. Eh. So if they wear slippers, no, basically hindi naman magrarab yung halux valgus deformity dun sa shoes, no. So they're still able to walk uh, painlessly, no. But in patients na temperate countries, no, may winter, hindi sila pwede magchinelas kasi. They are forced to wear shoes, no? Because of this, they have they will uh, encounter chronic pain due to poor food. Oh, so kaya po sila nagpapa opera. But yes, we have procedures to correct the bunion deformity and to prevent uh, eventual arthritis, no? Right, po. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Alpuerto. And while we're with you, uh, can we get on to the next question about? Uh, using duro lane with ACP, okay. then so doing uh, HA injection five times. Um, I think. Can you comment on this question? Same effect, but fast active reaction. I, I'm not familiar with the ano ma'am the hyaluronic injection. So this is I think a hyaluronic it, acid. Yes, ma'am. Both of them. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Both of them are hyaluronic acid. No. But maybe because uh, depending on the molecular weight of the hyaluronic acid, some, some with lower molecular weight uh, products or brands will probably need uh, multiple injections. But some with a high molecular weight in, uh, product, no? maybe that's the Durolane. No? So you can, uh, no, you can just do one injection depending on the molecular weight. I usually just do one. I, I, I choose the high molecular weight hyaluronic acid for injection, but I don't do them in ano, in foot and ankle joints. Kasi mm -hmm. ano eh, they are really small joints and I use them mainly on the knees. Okay, this is uh, possibly more commonly done in the knees, right, uh, Dr. Yeah. Alcuerd? Uh -huh. And uh, let's go back to Dr. Ange. Ito yung isa pa, no? This is another very uh, important question for, especially for our lay. I think we have some audience uh, that uh, ask because this could be always asked by their patients, no? Ang pasma po ba? Oh, wow. Nakakapekto po ba? So this is possibly relation, pasma, foot pain. Mm -hmm. Yun ma'am, no? a very ano yan, common sa ating mga Pilipino, pasma. The term pasma kasi can mean a lot of things. Pwede siyang, depende sa experience and description ng patient. Sometimes pwedeng pasma can mean arthritis talaga, meaning because of joint inflammation. Sometimes yung pasma can mean 
problem sa nerve or neuropathy or yung iba vascular and it in etiology but this is a commonly used term in the clinics by our patients and i think it's up to us as their healthcare providers their doctor to assess ano bang ibig sabihin nung pasma kasi marami siyang pwede talagang ibig sabihin so di ba iba iba po yung characteristic if it's a uh, if it's an arthritis then you have your typical clinical features if it's a neuropathy iba rin yung presentation di ba you will get a uh, numbness paresthesia um uh, ano yun? changes in cold or heat perception pag vascular pag vascular in etiology iba rin so i think yes pasma is a real problem but it's just the common term used by our patients and it's up to us to determine ano yung ibig sabihin nila lang pasma yeah okay so uh, we are we are uh, we have a time limit but two important questions for dr santiago this is uh, as regards uh, fresh pineapple juice for ra or oa and red wine can it cause arthritis ah okay red wine red yung sa red wine uh, siguro um if you are an alcoholic, tama ba? if you drink excessively, then that can be a risk factor uh, still. One of the risk factors for you to develop a high uric acid level, obesity, which in the future can lead to arthritis. So not directly, but it can be a risk factor, especially if it is excessive drinking. But if it's just, kunyari... Um, Diba, pinapayagan naman ng red wine, ma'am, no? Paminsan-minsan and in moderate amounts. So, um, hindi naman. In terms of um, yung question about pineapple, fresh pineapple, basta ang, tic- ang dietary advice is to eat a healthy diet. A heart-healthy diet, which is high in fiber. So, merong mga bagong studies uh, saying that a vegetable-based diet is very useful in and beneficial in patients with arthritis. No, so sa akin basta ang advice namin sa patients ay healthy diet. So your pineapple juice can help give you vitamin C and fiber. So go ahead, wala namang problem. Okay, thank you, Dr. Santiago. And then possibly this will be uh, our last question. And this is for Dr. Alberto. Thank you for an excellent lecture. My question is, how much does it cost to have a surgical procedure, uh, ankle arthroplasty in question? Uh, well, currently, there's still no ankle arthroplasty implants in the Philippines. There's no uh, local distributor, no. But if you base it uh, uh, on international uh implants no they are they are quite expensive talaga no uh especially if you're thinking of branded implants uh, Johnson and Johnson the Puisintes uh, uh you are talking of probably mga around mga 300 to 500k siguro i i think for the striker the Puisintes Biomet implants no the branded ones quite expensive Pero wala pa nga sila dito sa Pilipinas. I hope we can bring this soon. The problem is the indication. There are really strict indications for you to be able to do ankle arthroplasty. Most patients will have deformities and you are better off doing an, an ankle fusion. Ankle fusion is quite cheap. Like the one I showed you, uh, using two screws lang, two big screws. Yung screws lang na yun, each screw would probably cost between five to 10,000 pesos. So that's really cheap, no? Plus the procedures, so ambilis, no? Uh, it's, it's really not expensive. Patients are happy uh, post-operatively, and you are not, uh, you know, you are not uh, scared that uh, you will injure vital structures in the ankle. Hindi siya, uh, hindi siya sobrang invasive, and and you will not think of revision rates in the future. The problem with uh, uh, Fusion, any fusion of the joint now will affect the other joints uh, 
yung mga malapit na joints dun sa pews na joint, lalo na sa spine, sa foot and ankle. So, usually in seven years' time, meron ng uh, radiographic evidence of arthritis din yung, ano, yung mga adjacent joints. But yeah. then again, the management of arthritis is basically pain, no? Uh, symptomatic. If the, even if you have evidence of arthritis in your x-rays, it doesn't mean that you would need surgery. It's, it's a bottom line clinical uh, clinical appearance or yung symptoms ng patient pa rin. No? Ayun, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Santiago and Dr. Alcuerto. We're at the end of our session. And maybe our take-home message really is that ankle pain or foot pains are really caused, uh, are caused by so many diseases. And among the important uh, diseases that were discussed are on the inflammatory arthritis, but the more common one is on uh, is osteoarthritis that is uh, possibly uh, age related as well as you know multiple traumas over the years. And as we as uh, we call it, it's a wear and tear condition, uh, especially in the foot where we don't so much. Uh, expect uh, osteoarthritis in the ankles. Yes, the bunions would be very painful conditions. And so the other very important take home message is that we now have foot surgeons. So for our patients who have uh, refractory uh, pain, no, we've uh, <clears throat> exhausted our medical management, especially for the inflammatory arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and the like then we can always call a friend, a surgeon friend. Okay, so uh, we hope that uh, soon our uh, foot clinic in the Philippine General Hospital will take uh, flight. It will take off on a smile na si Dr. Alpuerto, no pressure, <laughs> but, uh, and uh, can, uh, before I end, uh, maybe the acupressure slippers can be answered. Uh, online <laughs> uh, so thank you very much to our speakers and to the more than 450 of our attendees and thank you for all your very interesting questions bye see you next year <laughs>